Good afternoon. My name is Jazine Alders, and I'm a research coordinator with the McMaster Institute of Research on Aging, or MIRA. First of all, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us for this webinar today. As we get started, I would like to invite MIRA members and trainees to apply for the MIRA Graduate Student Professional Development Award and the MIRA Undergraduate Summer Research Fellowship, so you can find the link to our funding page. It will be appearing in the chat box. So we have a few tips for getting the most out of our seminar today. On your Zoom screen, in the top right-hand corner, you should see an icon. If the wording under the icon says gallery view, click on the icon once, and this should change it to speaker view. We ask that you mute yourselves to eliminate any background noise or feedback during the presentation. If a question or comment occurs to you during the presentation portion of the seminar, we ask that you please put it in the chat box. You should see the chat icon on the bottom of your screen, and we will review these during the question and answer portion of the seminar. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. I would like to begin this meeting by recognizing and acknowledging that McMaster University is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. The McMaster Institute for Research on Aging has developed a reputation for its ability to facilitate connections between McMaster researchers across all six faculties thus driving interdisciplinary research. Since MIRA launched in 2016, we have hosted multiple in-person events and exercises to facilitate interdisciplinary connections, as well as connections with national and international partner institutions. And continuing in this tradition today, we'll be crossing disciplines at McMaster University to discuss the topic of dementia and driving. Our first speaker will be Dr. Richard Stramko. Dr. Stramko is an assistant professor at McMaster University and practices geriatric medicine at St. Peter's and Jurovinsky Communicate, sorry, Jurovinsky Hospitals in Hamilton. He has a keen interest in e-health and is a founder of a physician communication software called Area Electronic Health Record and Handover, which focuses on healthcare provider communication. He has also founded an online education tool called iGera Care, to help caregivers of patients with dementia improve caregiver self-efficacy. Our second speaker, Dr. Brenda Verklian, is a professor of occupational therapy at McMaster University and leads and co-leads multiple projects focused on mobility and aging. The primary goal of Dr. Verklian's research is to develop innovative ways to support older adults in their out-of-home activities and participation. Her research objectives seek to use best evidence to design and develop interventions that improve activity performance in later life and engage with older adults and other stakeholders to prioritize areas of research that optimize their mobility. She's a member of CanDrive, a research initiative focused on supporting older drivers, as well as an international collaboratorium that aims to address disparities in health, aging, and community access. Um, Due to some technical difficulties, we're gonna have Dr. Brenda Berkeley and speak first, and then we'll turn our time over to Dr. Richard Stramko. Brenda, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. And thanks for that kind introduction. And I'm going to uh, share my screen as we do. And can you see my screen? Jazine, can you give me the thumbs up? Yes, and you see my full screen? I see the view that, yeah, I don't see your presenter notes, so I see the That's screen. fantastic. Okay, so uh, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. And it's wonderful to be here uh, talking about a, a topic that is really important to me and important to all of us. And uh, I recognize it's been a challenging time. In fact, today is one year uh, since our occupational routines and everyday activities were uh, disrupted. And, and I think it's important that to reflect on that um, due to, yeah, due to COVID-19. But today we are going to talk about another uh, challenging issue, which is driving and dementia. And so in preparation for this topic, I started to reflect a little bit on what brought me here today, uh, sort of going back to uh, my work uh, as an occupational therapist when I first first launched, uh, launched my career in Chatham, Ontario. And for those of you who may not be aware where Chatham sits, um, it sits in the southwestern corridor, a few hours uh, southwest 
of here. It sits along one of the busiest highways in Canada, if not the busiest, the 401, a few kilometers from there. And, and that's where I started to work um, in the hospital. But like many communities in Canada, Chatham is sort of the, I'll call it the mega community, even at a population at 45,000. Uh, um, it actually, uh, many, it's a, it's a center uh, where the hospital is, for example, um, where you probably do your grocery shopping, see your doctor and do those other occupations that are important to you. So as an occupational therapist, uh, my focus is really, and our focus as a profession is really helping you do the day-to-day -day, uh, things that occupy your time or your activities. And driving in and of itself is an occupation, but it's also a connector occupation, right? It's the, it provides the means uh, for us to be able to get to the places and people that are important to us. Not surprisingly, COVID-19 has impacted, as I said, our everyday occupational routines. Um, and like myself, I'm no longer <laughs> driving uh, to the office. I'm working right from home. So, so even my driving and the way I move around my community has changed. So today's agenda, I'm, I am going to follow uh, my journey a little bit uh, as a professor in terms of embarking not only on my clinical career, but also my research career um, and covering some of the major areas. So in fact, uh, it is my program of research uh, here at McMaster. So we are going to focus on dementia as one of many uh, medical conditions that can impact our ability uh, to drive. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then uh, also planning ahead and thinking about uh, life without a car and what that, can, what that can mean. And then also we know that our driving environment is changing. And so that's something else we want to keep in mind. So we know why is this issue important, right? We know that falls and motor vehicle collisions are actually the leading causes of injury related hospitalizations in those age 65 and older. And in fact, working with my colleague, Dr. Beauchamp, who focuses on falls, whereas I'm focused on the, um, the other modes of mobility, uh, including walking in our, in our community, as we know that is important. But, um, uh, and obviously when we drive, we often get out of our car uh, to walk as well. So, I, I mean, a lot of the things we do are interrelated. Um, and so that's something we need to keep in mind. Fortunately, uh, fatalities, uh, being involved in a motor vehicle collision, fatalities have dropped. And that's partly due to some of the uh, safety uh, innovations that we've had in our, in our vehicles. And, and there's other innovations coming, of course. But, um, but injuries are still tough to recover from, particularly in late life and uh, and so that's something we need to keep in mind and is of concern. So I'm going to walk you through a very busy graph here. I'm going to uh, make you do use some of your thinking skills and some of your cognitive skills right away. So um, so what we want to do is just look at the orange uh, bars on this graph first, and then the y-axis on the left. Um, on the x-axis, you can see age, and it's presented in five-year bands. And so what we see across the lifespan is we see that collisions, uh, not surprisingly, are higher in um, uh, in in our uh, in our youth, and that's due for a number of reasons. Uh, there have been <clears throat> changes in licensure here uh, in Canada and and beyond in terms of uh, improving uh, to try to prevent those collisions. Right, so we put in things like graduated licensing for young adults, and and those collisions have dropped. Now, if we just look at the turquoise bars, uh, now we look at miles driven per year. And not surprisingly, we see that in our, uh, in our middle life, uh, so to speak, when we are uh, going to work, uh, and again, things have changed due to the pandemic this past year, but you can see that uh, we do most of our driving or driving exposure or our driving spaces, sometimes we refer to it as, is uh, the highest in, in midlife and then sort of drops again as we <clears throat> move forward in our lifespan. And finally, you can see this U-shaped line, uh, which is related to car drivers uh, involved in collisions per uh, per billion vehicle miles traveled. And again, when we take into account uh, sort of the one end of our, our lifespan, um, in, in older adulthood. There's a number of reasons for why collisions are higher there. Same with at the other end of the, at the lifespan in terms of youth, where 
starts inexperience, some distraction um, amongst other issues. But at this end, in terms of age seven and older, we do see uh, a higher rate of collisions. One thing we need to keep in mind, however, is that it's not just age, right? So we need to figure out in this circle, what are or who are uh, most at risk. And so uh, that's something we're going to talk about today in terms of dementia. So when we think about people uh, living with all kinds of conditions, including dementia, amongst others, um, most of the time there is a circle of care around that person in terms of family and friends. And it's, it's, this is a tough one, right? Because we have to weigh the clinical decisions around uh, driving and trying to figure that out while thinking about out of home participation um, and some of those occupations that I talked about. So today we are going to talk more about driving uh, or focus on, on the medical condition of dementia, but we wanna keep in mind um, all of you know, how we make those decisions and what, what some of the evidence says. So I'm gonna go back a little ways in some of the evidence because what I appreciate about the work of Dr. David Ebby, who's uh, a colleague from the University of Michigan, is that they outfitted uh, cars way back when with, um, uh, with some sensors, with some trackers to see how uh, people with early stage, <clears throat> excuse me, early stage dementia uh, managed in their community in terms of driving. And then they, they had a comparable healthy older adult group. And what they saw was driving exposure, as, as you'll remember from that graph. Uh, being more significantly restricted um, in terms of uh, distance traveled from home. But yet, though, they had comparable driving behaviors. So in terms of their actual behavior behind the wheel, it was very comparable to healthy older adults. But what they saw was some of those high-level changes um, and, and the, the cognition that we need to be able to get around our commuting, including navigation, were some of the things that they saw um, in terms of <clears throat> early changes. So uh, what, that, what that research tells us is that people with early dementia may be medically fit to drive for a length of time, but certainly need to be monitored. Then another colleague at the University of, of Washington, she's uh, an occupational therapist, Peggy Barco, and her and her colleagues also looked at driving errors in a group of people with dementia and then with a comparable group. And they saw, uh, not surprising, that when we get into more complex road maneuvers, uh, we will see changes, but also on seemingly simple tasks, which are not simple. Uh, a lot of the things we do when we drive are very complex, but lane maintenance also being a problem with people sort of moving into other lanes. And they associated some of those behaviors with some underlying what I'll call uh, components that we need to drive, right? So lower visual attention, again, problems with executive functioning and, and spatial abilities. <clears throat> so when we're thinking about the occupations we do every day, we can analyze them. And I know there's some uh, graduates of our program on the line. And every day we're looking at the things people do and thinking about um, what it takes to perform those tasks and how can we work and partner to enable people to do those, uh, those important uh, occupations. So when we break it down, it gets complex. Uh, and this makes driving look very linear when we know it's not, this is actually very messy. Uh, I'll say in terms of the complexity, we know the environment around the vehicle is also changing. So we need executive function, again, that navigation and, and strategic level um, and attention. And even when I made you look at that graph, you had to think only focus on one thing. So selective attention. Um, and those are things that we need when we're driving every day. So it gets very, very complex. And so what we try to do in an office-based assessment um, as an occupational therapist, we're not there to diagnose the medical condition, but we're there to look at the implications perhaps on everyday life. And so uh, what we're trying to do is pull out some of those office-based assessment tools, and we'll talk about that in a moment, to try to determine whether and how that feeds into driving ability. The hard part here is it's a tough one, right? Because those components, sometimes the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, uh, so to speak. So if we notice that something's missing, I mean, humans are amazing, we can adapt. Uh, we've seen that uh, over the course of the pandemic as well, but we can adapt and change. And so it is important, in fact, um, some researchers have been looking at early, at training, retraining uh, in people with early dementia and how that can help them maintain their driving uh, skills. So I am here to say, I know there's some uh, clinicians on the line, and uh, I know Richard will, will hopefully touch on this as well, but uh, we know that there's not a single tool that can determine uh, fitness to drive. And in fact, uh, the Canadian Medical Association, 
And I'll post links to some uh, documents uh, that are helpful at the end of my presentation in the chat. But um, the section on dementia in the Canadian Medical Association, their fitness to drive, which is a really uh, helpful resource. Again, it's um, for physicians, but they talk about different diagnoses and the implications it can have. And dementia, that section's been revised a few times, the latest in, in, in 2019, and certainly speaks to uh, the challenges in terms of uh, determining uh, medical fitness to drive. So unless somebody is quite in the severely impaired range, uh, then that tells us that probably driving amongst other activities of daily living are an issue. So you say, why don't we just put people on the road? <clears throat> and put them behind the wheel. And, uh, and that's not actually we a, a road test uh, and sort of a typical road test is not the best predictor either. So what we see is we pulled some of the data, uh, some of the data from some studies that looked at uh, driving behavior. And we look again at that early, some of the early changes. We know that dementia, and, and, and perhaps my colleague will talk about that because he's uh, permitted to diagnose as part, as, uh, as part of his uh, training, um, that there's differences, there's different types of dementia. And I'm not here to talk about all those different types, but you know, it's very complex. There's Alzheimer's, there's Parkinson's related dementia amongst, um, amongst others. So if we're at that very, very mild dementia or mild dementia, um, we can see that people still are able to manage and drive, which again speaks to what my, um, some of the findings in the earlier studies that I showed, right? We have comparable driving behaviors, but we do see as dementia progresses that there are some changes. You can also see even in the healthy, so-called healthy controls, I'll use air quotes, uh, that uh, there are people that also fail uh, this driving test, and that can be for a number of reasons. And so um, that's something to keep in mind about the value of the test. So we say, why not screen everybody in, uh, you know, in terms of public health screening? And I'm not here to talk about what Ontario does with older drivers, but in fact, they do have a process uh, that's involved in terms of license renewal for those aged 80 and above. But Denmark in this study did put in um, some screening for those aged 70 and older. And you'll remember, we saw that U-shaped curve uh, go up at about age 70. And they put in uh, basically a, a short uh, mini mental status exam and then a clock draw uh, for people age 70 and older and as well as some screening they had for younger drivers and there were some unintended consequences in fact what we see is that pedestrian uh, falls increased pedestrian fatalities I'm sorry increased I shouldn't say it was because of falls but perhaps it was which does make us think about you know the unintended consequences when we, when we decide uh, or that somebody you know stops driving that they may walk and that may not be the best way to get around our, our community and unfortunately we do hear about pedestrian fatalities um, and injuries here uh, in Hamilton and, and our other communities in Canada so we just have to think about these consequences right we take away one form of transportation and give it to another. I know my colleague, uh, Dr. Bruce Newbold is on here as well and uh, has done some excellent work with his colleagues in geography to think about, you know, in rural areas, we, we were uh, a part of a chapter that one of his students was also involved in some analyses. And when we think about rural areas and the ability to walk, um, obviously that's also has implications. So we have to think about the environment um, as well. So uh, it's not easy to make these decisions. And uh, Dr. Uh, Anna Bizinski uh, from, from the University of Ottawa is a, is a geriatrician as well, like, like Richard, and, and has put together with some colleagues this driving and dementia toolkit. And what you see is I'm going to call it a checklist, but it's not a checklist, right? Because what we do when we're assessing or having conversations uh, with our clients or with uh, people with different conditions is we're observing, we're interviewing, we're talking to them, um, and we're, we're picking up on different cues. We're asking them questions. So we know, um, and I'm not going to go through each uh, level here, but we arrive at clinical impressions um, with people. And it's not surprising that we use cognitive tests sometimes to validate some of those impressions. We can't just pull out a screening tool uh, just because that's part of our everyday practice. We have to have good reason and rationale. And it could be uh, that we notice uh, some changes in terms of the way they're speaking or people voice uh, memory uh, changes. Um, or, or they notice things in their in their loved one, and that becomes part of our our clinical picture. But we can use tests like the trail making test, uh, which has you know a three error or three minute rule. That's also emerged um, as a potential 
um, predictor, so to speak, or helping to inform our clinical decision making. But there's all kinds of caution warranted. Again, I'll say not just one test, right? There needs to be, um, we need to form that clinical picture. And so using different tools, we can help to do that. If people are having problems with activities of daily living or occupations, and of course, ADLs are, are close to uh, an occupational therapist aorta, right? This is this is really important is that when, when people start to experience uh, uh, or start to exhibit some of those, um, some of some challenges in terms of performing their ADLs and what we'll call them as instrumental activities of daily living. So two or more of those, we get very concerned about driving. So that's things like uh, uh, banking, uh, complex activities of daily living, grocery shop. They're just uh, they're starting to have a hard time with those things. If people are already having a hard time with basic activities of daily living, and that's just self-care, uh, that's dressing yourself, that's, you know, routine um, activities in terms of, um, sometimes we think about that as our morning or evening uh, routine before bed, but some of those things we have to do to take care of ourselves. If we're already having problems with our basic activities of daily living, probably uh, we're not in a good place to be driving at all. But what we see oftentimes in terms of the this clinical impression is that it doesn't always fit uh, perfectly. We're still a bit in the gray. We're a little bit unsure. And that's when we want to, we can't send everybody for a behind the wheel evaluation. I think we have to still try to figure that, you know, it is, is, a, is a behind the wheel evaluation necessary. And sometimes it is. So you say, Maybe you say, I don't know, but uh, you say that a ministry, so let's just do ministry driver tests. Well, a ministry driver test really is not testing uh, changes in medical uh, or health related uh, changes. It's just testing some you know, basic driving skills. Whereas a comprehensive driving evaluation does involve an occupational therapist. Um, and here in Ontario, we have fabulous ones that uh, have expertise in this area. This is what they do is they, they meet with people um, who've been referred uh, and there's they work with driving instructors as well in partnership. You go, you know, you get into a dual brake vehicle um, and that's important too. We should be able to operate uh, not just our own car, car, but other people's cars as well. So sometimes people say, well, I'm not in my own car. I'm not, you know, that's not how I usually uh, drive, but in essence, we should be able to transfer those skills. And it's important that we have a dual brake uh, vehicle, obviously, as well. But um, we, the, you know, the, the person will go through an office-based clinical assessment, and there's this notion of a graded approach, which for those OTs on the line know that we sort of move from, um, you know, lower, low density uh, traffic, perhaps, and, and sort of easier areas, you know, starting in a parking lot and working our way to more complex uh, driving environments. And of course, uh, errors and, and thinking about retraining. Now there is a cost. It's, a, you know, this, this examination is extensive and expensive for us to get a good picture. Um, but this is the kind of thing that we, that's why we want to identify those most at risk and do a better job doing that. So as we round the bend here in terms of, um, you know, can we do better, right? Identifying those most at risk. And so I was part of a, a study here across Canada, and we had a cohort here in Hamilton of almost, uh, you know, over 100 uh, participants that we followed in terms of their health and driving patterns, because you'll remember exposure is a really important uh, factor. And we see that space that people are driving become more restricted. Um, and so that can also be a, a, a clue. So we are working our way through uh, to manuscript uh, submission uh, in terms of developing that tool. It needs to go through a peer review process, but you're probably not surprised to hear that some of the things involved in that assessment uh, tool or screening tool is, it does involve executive function, it has cognition elements, visual processing, and then also a physical element, uh, thinking about people's everyday mobility. So one thing we were surprised when we did this study and working with my PhD student, who is no longer a PhD student, Dr. Rahina Sangar, who's on the line as well, we were so surprised from our can drive studies, people wanted feedback on their driving. And so off we went to develop uh, a, an approach because people don't want to talk about planning ahead. Uh, they don't want to talk about driving retirement. Obviously, uh, sometimes that conversation is happening uh, with the physician, with the occupational therapist. It's not easy. So how do we start those conversations earlier? Well, maybe it is within a driver 
uh, checkup. And so that's something we are uh, studying, which was showcased in CAA uh, magazine this past winter, our approach. And it was an interesting uh, to, to work with the, with the author of this article, because at first he came at it, there is ageism involved here. You know, he came at what's, you know, what's the matter with older drivers. And I said, well, let's flip that uh, around a little bit and think about um, the importance of driving. And so uh, this article, and I'll, uh, again, I'll talk about, I'll, I'll have a link. So actually, an older driver was featured in this article who's been a partner on our projects and people know that I often uh, invite Mary Mills to speak uh, at these things because so she's re really been an important part of, of my research bouncing around ideas initial ideas with her and Mary I wondered if you'd be able to uh, unmute yourself and maybe just share what the impact this has had um, on the work you did with Rahina and I. Well, I was very lucky to be able to have a behind the wheel evaluation, which enabled me also <clears throat> to analyze the many things that I don't do because as an 82 year old, pardon? We can't see you, but I, we okay. can hear you, but that's okay. Right. I, I like seeing you. There we go, Mary. Okay. Perfect. I All like right. you. <laughs> so I had this behind the wheel evaluation with Dr. Birkley's team, which was extremely interesting. And I was videotaped. And then I had a, an instructor tell me later and in writing and in person all the things that I wasn't quite quick enough, like rear view mirrors and turning left and turning left and not looking right. And it was so very interesting for me to try to correct myself. But at the same time, I had already decided when I was 80 and got a bus pass and an Uber app and a bus transit app that I was going to stop driving. And I was all set to give up my car and I was going to except the pandemic happened. And I decided it would be too difficult to travel in public transport. But I think it's really important that people plan ahead for the day when they might not be able to drive. So it doesn't come as such a shock. It's hard to give up driving. And it's not that easy to always be a pedestrian because the street lights are often quite uh, slow when you can't, don't have time to get across. But economically, I think it's a good thing for seniors to do. And I think if you look more positively at it, especially in cities, in rural areas, that's kind of a different story. It's a lot harder to give up your car. And I guess it's hard to give up your car, but I think if you figure out ways of getting around and doing things on your own, and if you're in fairly good health, I think it can be done successfully. So, Thanks, Mary. Yeah. So I think um, what Mary talks about, right, is obviously Mary's in a position. Thank you so much, Mary, because um, You're welcome. Mary is in a, in a position to think ahead. We can think about privilege, those kinds of things as well, but it's something to keep in mind. So as we wrap up here, Mary and I have also talked about how vehicles are changing as well in terms of their design and what impact that might have on aging. So I did have an opportunity to speak three years ago uh, to a Senate committee in Ottawa that was put together uh, to start to think ahead. And you're probably not surprised to hear that they weren't thinking about uh, aging drivers and the demographic changes that are happening. So as we wrap up this conversation, you know, immediate issues come to mind, right? Like, let alone it being a challenging conversation for clinicians, it's a challenge for families and for loved ones, right? So uh, lots of discussion, hopefully by planning ahead, um, we uh, address those issues, but there are strategies, but nobody is saying that this process is easy. Um, and certainly the Alzheimer's Society and other organizations, particularly the Alzheimer's Society, obviously I thank them. Uh, we thank them for all the support that they're giving to uh, caregivers and, and, and people uh, living with dementia every day. We do need to plan, as, as Mary said, very simply, if you're, uh, if you're thinking about it, what activities are you doing? And just think about your life. And, and I think an occupational therapist becomes a really important partner in that project. So as we as we as I wrap up here and, and give the microphone over to uh, my colleague, uh, I just think we have since my time in Chatham come a long way in terms of creating awareness about community mobility. We have there's partnerships that have happened across sectors se sectors and stakeholders, but we still uh, have yet to sort of have that tool that helps informs clinical practice. There are new ways of moving around the community. Here's an autonomous vehicle in Sweden. Uh, yes, they have snow, so it is important for us to think about how 
how are the different ways we're going to move around our community and be able to identify those changes early, right? And is there something we can do to intervene? And so I am involved in co-leading a project with Dr. Marla Beauchamp uh, from the School of Rehabilitation Science, amongst others. On the line, Dr. Newbold is also involved, but thinking about those early mobility changes and is there something uh, we can do? Uh, but first, we need to understand those changes. And, and those changes can come in, in, in the way, different ways that we move in our community, including driving. So uh, I will close there and uh, of course want to thank my colleagues and, and people like Mary, uh, my amazing students who are off and doing amazing things um, as well as Dr. Sangar is doing. So thanks very much and Richard it's over to you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and my apologies for springing uh, going first on you as I had some technical difficulties but I just wanted to thank you for all the amazing research that you're doing that informs our clinical practice on the ground. So I am a geriatrician. Um, so I clinically practice with older adults in complex medical diseases, including uh, dementias, neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson's as well, um, all of which kind of converge and um, impact people's abilities to, to drive. And kind of what I wanted to bring to the table here was just the impact on personal narrative. Uh, admittedly, nothing makes me more uncomfortable than dealing with this issue in clinical practice because it's such a high stakes game for the patient. And unfortunately, there's not amazing high quality research in an algorithmic sense where I can just say, hey, your score is this, you failed. And I can feel good about myself. There's lots of in-between areas. Um, and that really impacts somebody's life in a major way. And I think driving is a taken for the most taken for granted uh, privilege that we have. It's a privilege that's granted to us by society as a whole. And you know, um, Dr. Berkeley mentioned this, but if you're going to uh, embark or engage in any of your hobbies or you want to maintain some sort of social life or uh, you want to get out to get your groceries, uh, it's great in a city that we have alternative methods of transportation. But once you stop being able to do those things, it impacts you in a major way. And you feel as though you, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from my experience, not as a patient, obviously, but my experience dealing with with patients and they feel as though they become a burden to their friends and their family and they don't have the same sense of strong self-identity and there can be a, a major effect on people's mental health including depression and social isolation and sometimes it can be a bit of a downward spiral also when you're taking somebody's license away and they're cognitively impaired they don't have insight into the fact sometimes that they have problems and major problems um, but they can remember that you took their license away. And so it does uh, spark a lot of anger and frustration and resentment. And sometimes that spills over into their personal lives as well, which is a major issue. The other reason I say it's a taken for granted privilege or skill is that um, it's really complicated. And uh, again, Dr. Berkeley mentioned all the ways in which it's complicated, but I think we just take it for granted as a natural skill when we're driving in our everyday lives. But um, you're doing multiple processes across multiple cognitive domains and you need to be quite attentive. Um, but people, when they're approaching driving, always say, well, I've been driving for 30 years and I don't have any problems. And I was a fighter pilot in World War II and I drove a city bus for the last 30 years, but they don't recognize um, that even subtle changes in um, cognition can cause large problems as well. You know, dementia uh, or major neurocognitive disorder, so they're a heterogeneous group of conditions, um, some of which are kind of reversible in nature and some of which are not, and chronic and progressive. So somebody may be com coming to me and have a really slow um, processing time and their executive function may be off. They can't change cognitive sets and they can't pay attention to things. They can't multitask. Occasionally it might be because their thyroid is off. They have hypothyroidism. And so all I have to do is give them additional thyroid hormone and I can reverse that change. So I may have to suspend their license temporarily and then when they improve and get better. But I would say, you know, 98, 99% of the time, uh, the cognitive changes are more related to either vascular damage to the brain in which either small blood vessels or large blood vessels are damaged or they're related to toxic proteins which accumulate and will cause shrinkage of certain areas of the brain and eventually death. And when that damage happens to the brain, it impacts all of the different cognitive domains that Dr. Ripplian um, mentioned. And obviously when that happens, they're unable to perform the cognitive skills necessarily, necessary for driving. 
because it is heterogeneous, you can have people that will have um, very pronounced deficits in one area. And so, um, for instance, some people may have really bad visuospatial function at the beginning of their illness. Their memory and thinking might be intact, their language might be intact. Um, you know, they may have all of the coordination necessary and strength necessary to be in a car, but they won't be able to resolve space appropriately. And they bump into objects more frequently. They can't navigate through the streets more frequently. So um, taking into consideration the fact that somebody might have very different presentation, I think is also important and that there's not a one size fits all approach across all of the various um, different types of um, dementia. I think too, playing into this, like uh, I would never look just at the cognitive impairment side of things. So the other medical conditions that we commonly see that impact somebody's ability to drive would be cardiac disease. So if they had really bad valve disease and they were passing out because of it, there's an association with age and seizure disorders. So if you've had recent seizures or they're uncontrolled, you might not be able to drive. If um, you have obstructive sleep apnea as well, um, and that's untreated and you're very tired during the day and passing out while you're driving. And then if you've had heart attacks or anything like that recently, medications that are causing uh, sedation uh, get quite common as people get older. People will have difficulties sleeping and so they'll need like a sedative hypnotic or at least they're prescribed. They might need a different medication, but they're prescribed sedative hypnotics, a lot of pain medications or uh, psychiatric medications, the incidence of, of prescription does increase with all those medications and age. And so we have to be mindful of how they're interacting. One of the reasons why we, we think about it in totality, so the cognitive point part, um, as well as all of these other uh, areas is that we can modify some of them and those uh, disease processes when modified can actually improve somebody's cognition as well. Um, so I think it's important to kind of think of all those things in in totality with respect to that. Um, so I have a bit of a referral bias. I don't do any of the screening on the population level and I don't see people in their primary care physician's office. So um, I get referred people generally for complex medical illness and for the cognitive impairment. And so that's kind of the lens with which I see them. Um, when they come into my office, uh, we'll do a history. So we ask them a bunch of questions, a physical examination. We will review any investigation. So that could be blood work or imaging of the brain. And we'll also perform cognitive testing. Um, when we get historical information from people, we always interview the patient. And separately, uh, we'll interview a caregiver or a friend who can provide us collateral information because people that have cognitive impairment don't always understand that they have cognitive impairment. So we can ask people um, about their driving and what the experience of the patient is and what the experience of the caregiver is. We'll ask frequently about um, accidents or near misses. We'll ask about bumps or scrapes on the car. We'll ask about how pe safe people feel when they're in the car uh, with the person with cognitive impairment. Um, whether or not they're impulsive or angry when they're driving. And I think one of those magical questions is, would you let your grandchild or child in the car with the person? Because I think people want to um, justify why they should be able to keep driving because it's often a, a very large inconvenience when they stop. And so sometimes people will lie to themselves and be like, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But when they think about their grandchild being in the car with that person, it kind of cuts through all of the murkiness. Um, and then with respect to the physical examination, there are different types of dementias where people's movements might be quite slow or their coordination is impaired. They might have other sensory problems where they can't feel their hands or feet um, and they can't react quite as quickly. Uh, also our physical examination will help us pick up on the other conditions mentioned previously. And then uh, when we get to the cognitive testing stage, so this is what I'm hoping Dr. Berkeley and will come up with one day is that perfect, that perfect little test that I can do in my office that will answer all of my questions and be scientifically re reliable and valid. But we do go through those various tests. The mini mental state examination is highly dependent on episodic or short term memory. And so it's not a very hard test. Like when you think about driving, it's very complex skill. So the MMSE, I don't, I don't pay much attention to just because it's too easy. 
The MOOC is great because it, it does test visuospatial function, episodic memory, language, and executive function to a much higher degree. And it also breaks it down into subscores. So you can see all of the different parts of the brain functioning independently. So I do, I do rely on that quite, uh, quite heavily. And then the trails B, anytime driving is a question, we will always perform the trails B. And um, I do find though, the history is always the most compelling thing in the stories and narratives that people tell. Um, and then the cognitive testing more backs up what I was going to do based on that. And so hopefully all of those things are coming together and telling you a clear story. The family's concerned, they're not comfortable. The cognitive, the MOCA test that I just did is backing it up. The trails B is a clincher. It's like, oh, they've got five mistakes and took them four minutes. I feel very comfortable and confident on that. There are times where, um, you know, let's say somebody's performing poorly because they're English as a second language or they had a low educational status, which impacts their ability to score well. And then their family's telling me they're great, they're fine, I have no concerns. That's a little more anxiety uh, invoking um, for me at that time. And then, um, you know, after we've taken all of those things into consideration, um, if it tells a very clear story to me, I will submit a report um, to the Ministry of Transportation saying, uh, you know, this is the condition, these are their test scores, this is how it's impacting their ability to drive. You know, I would recommend, you know, that they don't drive anymore. And then sometimes there's the in-between phase um, where I will refer them to online or on-road testing or comprehensive assessments. The challenge that is that the people that maybe can't afford $800 or $500 out of their um, uh, pocket, they're kind of stuck in that situation, right? Which is very unfortunate. I think there's probably some room for uh, advocacy in that sense for the government to actually pay officially for all of those tests for people. I think it's medically indicated and it impacts them to such a, a strong degree. Um, and just to be clear, I don't, I'm not the one who takes the license away. I just make recommendations to the government and they're officially responsible for following up and making sure everything's done. But um, I think that's more of a technicality because a lot of times they just listen to what, uh, what we as clinicians will say. And then uh, in terms of the aftermath, I mean, um, Dr. Berkley uh, mentioned it, um, there's the, the functional plan. And so, um, and I think it was Mary as well, is, is talking about the plan and coming up with and, and uh, anticipating what's coming down the road. And I think that's important for all aspects of health as we age as well. Like, you know, we, I plan with people regarding um, legal eventualities, making sure they have a power of attorney and all of those things in place, but also from a driving loss point of view. And there's the functional practical side of it, which is I'm gonna get you access to darts and I'm gonna make sure you have taxi vouchers and you've got your bus pass, as Mary said, and perhaps your family or your friends will be driving you around more frequently. Some people will give their car to a family member because they're not driving anymore, but in exchange for that free gift, the expectation is that they will help them drive and get transportation to all their appointments or groceries and things like that. Secondly, that's just as important as the psychological care that goes into it for people. So you do have a huge sense of, many people will have a huge sense of loss and grief loss of identity and as i said it impacts all of their social i mean it did more before covid but still um you know their, their social identity and, and uh, social behavior so for people that um are going through this process if you can putting counseling in place if they're open to it and other forms of psychological support monitoring them to see if they're getting depressed or become more socially withdrawn so you can get on it earlier and really um, be proactive in that sense because it's the, the practical but the emotional part of it and uh, the sense of grieving and loss is just as important um, in in my experience so I think that's a, a reasonable kind of clinical overview and I think we'll kind of give it back there yeah, no I really appreciate uh, you bringing that clinical lens sort of on the boots on the ground right in terms of that interaction uh, Richard, I think you're you're right. It's a challenging conversation. You're really seeing people sort of in the heat of the battle, right? But if we can start to get people to think about these things earlier, but as a society, we have a responsibility. Mobility is a right. Do you know what I mean? The driving's a privilege, Absolutely. but mobility, yeah. so supporting people through that process is something that is is really important.
important. And, um, you know, you sound like a very kind uh, person and just that kindness is so uh, critical to meet people where they're at. And I know even <clears throat> working with Dr. Anna Bazinski, who's who came up with the Driving and Dementia Toolkit, and I will post some things in the chat. She, we're working with uh, some people at Baycrest as well um, to develop a tool to help clinicians feel a little bit more confident and competent with older drivers with dementia and their caregivers on the team in terms of developing some tools to help people. But all that to say, I think Jazine came on the line because there may be some, some questions, but thank you very much. Thank you very much. And very different not to have slides, my goodness. Uh, right? So just to have a conversation, imagine that. So, uh, but uh, I know that there's people on the line too, uh, as clinician and looking for some of that evidence as well. So I think it was a good, good to have that. It's a good tag team. We didn't even plan this. Anything. <laughs> High five. High five, virtually. If you're allowed those on these virtual <laughs> things, you know. Yeah. Just Thank you, me. Richard and Brenda. Um, wonderful talks, very informative have lots of questions. Um, my first one though is what is your obligation as an occupational therapist or as a doctor? I have family members and friends that will not disclose some medical problems to their doctors because they're afraid that their license will be taken away. Is there something that you can say to reassure them that that's not immediately going to be the response or, or are you required to reach out to, to the ministry if you have concerns? Yeah, so um, I will say as an occupational therapist, we are in the legislation as well now and we have what we call as discretionary reporting, whereas our medical colleagues do have mandatory reporting as do nurse practitioners. Um, and so as I can speak from an occupational therapy perspective is uh, it may not be mandatory, but if we see something, we hear something and I say something that means that there's more to the picture, right? Um, mm -hmm. Watching them as Richard uh, said, right? You're watching, you're observing, you're listening, you're, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, involving the, the patient in that, in that decision-making as much as you can as well. Um, and informing them along the way, uh, I think it is important that, yeah, we have discretionary reporting. So that means we also have a responsibility to let um, the ministry know directly as well, uh, if we suspect that driving is, is impacted, but it's all about how you set up that clinical exchange, right? In some mm -hmm. ways, um, and particularly if you're in primary care and Richard is still sort of one step away from primary care, which he alluded to. And when I say primary care, that means going into somebody's home. And you may have been, somebody may have been referred because they need their house looked at, right? In terms of making sure that they can manage in their house. And in fact, you weren't referred for driving, but you might see something there and hear something and, right? And, and, uh, and put that clinical mm -hmm. picture together. So making sure you inform the client why you're there, what you're looking at. Mobility should be part of something that we look at. It is something that people need to be able to move around their community, move around their home. And so those are things that we look at as an OT. So we will mention driving and, and and uh, take it from there. But uh, Richard, um, you have mandatory reporting. I don't know if you want to comment yeah. on challenging, right? It's very challenging. Um, I think, uh, but, you know, part of the question is how do you move forward when you find something and like the, the action has to be commensurate with risk. So, you know, if you showed up to somebody's house and their car is all smashed up and you've got their neighbor saying, I've seen them back over stuff multiple times, then your reaction needs to be immediate. You need to inform the person that you're doing that as well as anybody else. And then sometimes they're completely fine and you're good. And then sometimes it's in between. Mm -hmm. if it's in between and you're uh, unclear. It's always good to take a multidisciplinary approach. So you're talking with any healthcare, other healthcare providers, you're talking with any other healthcare um, members of the team. And then you're talking about any allied, talking to any allied health professionals. And if you don't have them in the house right away, then you can at least establish contact and in a longitudinal fashion, you're going to be observed on a more regular basis. So that's where I'm trying to get the local health integration network in to get an occupational therapist and do, to do a safety assessment, mm -hmm. have a physiotherapist observe them while they're walking. And then potentially over time, I can do, you know, one or two assessments and get to know them a little bit better. And then um, there's also this rumor mill that happens too, where it's like one family member will be like, oh, they're terrible is they're god awful and then talk to another family member and they're like oh they're great and then you talk to the patient and they're fine or somebody misinterpreted the fact mm -hmm. that their english as a second language has cognitive impairment when they're fine so you need to be very specific and precise in terms of what the problems are and how you're going to measure deficiencies uh specifically and then you know making sure it's not just a rumor mill situation 
in documenting all of that very carefully. So it can be it sounds like it's a very um, involved process. It's not yeah. something that not a snap decision that's going to be made. Yeah, definitely should not be a snap decision because it has such a big impact on people's yeah. lives. So we have a question from Rong Zhang. How will wider adoption of assistive driving technologies and vehicles change things? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, on Musk when you need them, right? Like yeah, I know. Here. Yeah, uh, and I know Rong, uh, yeah, and her colleagues in engineering are, are you know working on all kinds of things. Um, and where technologies are emerging in the car as well. Some things we don't even know uh, are there and know how to operate. But um, I think it's I think we're at a transformational time in in uh, uh, transportation, uh, almost as transformational as when uh, Henry Ford came up with the assembly line, uh, just in terms of sensors and cars being able to do mm -hmm. things like and supplement us. I actually see it as very promising. Of course, we can get into, um, you know, uh, cars having to make decisions uh, for us. And 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 there have been uh, crashes uh, that make the news as well in terms of autonomous driving. But I think it is uh, transformational. I don't think as humans, we are easily distracted. We have cognitive tunneling. Uh, we notice something and then look away look back uh, there's all kinds of issues so I think I think the car and the sensors particularly if we're thoughtful about them uh, and hopefully wrong in her colleagues which I know that they are are thinking about the design elements and the impact on the user so it's really that transaction um, that we're interested in but uh, Richard I don't know if you have any thoughts I think your response is completely great I don't have anything else to add we have another question from Laurie McCall are there any studies that show an average time in years from loss of license from, due to dementia to when someone needs or has to move into assisted living or long-term care? Um, yeah, I, I can't name any studies off the top of my head, but we do know, as I mentioned, and there have been studies looking at that we do uh, live without a license as well, uh, that women li live, uh, like everybody at at some point in their life, should we be so fortunate to uh, have an extended lifespan that most likely at towards the end of our life, we will live without being able to uh, drive, particularly the last five, six years, um, and how we manage them. The responsibility falls on family members. Uh, most of the time, so we call that informal caregivers, um, which can be, and I know there's a caregiving course through the McMaster Institute for Research on Aging um, to think about some of like, how do you manage those? So all of that to say it's, um, yeah, I'm not, uh, there's not an average time, I think, to Richard's point too, it's uh, heterogeneous. I never know how to say that word. But, um, and so we can't, I, I think we have to be very careful slotting people in to say, you know, you're diagnosed with dementia in five years, you're going to appear like this, right? Um, and this is what's going to happen. We can project that there's going to be changes that right now you might be safe to drive, but you know, that time is coming. And we know that from the, from the literature, but uh, Richard, I don't know if you have any other yeah, I think I think that makes sense. Even um, see, even amongst Alzheimer's disease patients that have very specific pathology that's causing their dementia, you can have people that progress very rapidly with that, or they could take ten years from the time of diagnosis to the time of death. And so maybe at eight years they're in a long-term care facility. So as a rule of thumb, I'll tell people to accept the same or expect the same rate of change that they've seen over the course of the last year. You know, if they've been relatively stable, then they may, you know, ma maintain stability for some time. And then the difference too, between let's say somebody who had a stroke at one particular point in time and now has cognitive impairment as a result, but you know, they'll be stable for three, four, seven, 10 years, just because they had one, one incident. So again, it's being specific about the patient, the type of dementia that they have or the pathophysiology and the rate of progression that that specific pathology has in that specific patient. Because uh, you know, as you can imagine, if you have a high baseline level of intelligence and have all of these connections within the brain, um, you know, your brain can get beat up a little bit more before it shows the wear and tear in your day-to-day -day life. And so um, that can buffer things out and there's you know, genetics and things like that that also are at play there. So that's a complicated question. Not no one size fits all answer. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Brenda, you mentioned that you had um, spoken in front of the legislature. And I'm wondering if you're aware of, of any plans the government has to address this. Usually I think that if you lose your license and you're in a lower socioeconomic status, you have fewer options for getting around or if you live rurally as opposed to, to urban. Do you have any comments on that? 
Yeah, so I spoke at the Senate committee that, um, and so the Senate uh, sometimes call, calls special uh, inquiries into different areas, right? And so advancements in, in technology was one of them. But um, I think it is, it is a complex issue. And yeah, depending on the context that you're in, um, so here in Ontario, how we manage aging drivers is, is a and should be different from perhaps how Prince Edward Island <laughs> handles uh, their issues, right, in terms of the type of driving that's expected. So we'll hear from people, you know, I, I think Richard sort of talked about, I only drive in my own neighborhood, I only drive, you know, from here to, uh, to the grocery store, but we know that area is dynamic. Um, that things can change still. I just looked out my window the other day and I've never seen like little kids walking in that lovely daycare line on my street. And that's something brand new that I've never seen on my street. So things can change. Um, and that's why we wanna make sure we're at our best when we're behind the wheel. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I'll say about that. So we wanna keep an eye on our health and that's across the lifespan. We can experience a change at any point, I think um, in our lifespan that can impact our driving. And it's in fact, age 16 and older, uh, once you have a license that you have a responsibility to report yourself. You actually tick a box when you renew your license every five years. Has there been a change? People don't think about that, but has there been a change that can impact my driving? Of course, people are like, oh, there's no problem. But we do have responsibility um, anytime we get behind the wheel that we're, we're at our best. And, and certainly the police keep an eye on us, but... Um, we should keep an eye on ourselves too, but we're not the best judge uh, of, of if we don't have the insight, right? Mm -hmm. Now I'm just babbling, but Richard, I think we're, we're in the closing. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm hopeful. I don't know from a legislative point of view, right? Because, uh, you know, like I, I've testified in front of these committees too, and you feel so great because you've got your message across and you feel like you're advocating for all of these, you know, decisions. And then, you know, politicians do what politicians do sometimes and they just sit on their hands until there's a really big problem. I'm, ho I'm hopeful that some good could come out of this long-term care crisis and that the older adult aging population agenda might be, uh, you know, put at the forefront a little bit more so that we can have more thoughtful conversations about this. Um, there are major issues, not only in driving, but in um, consent and capacity assessments as well. Like there are major problems and slowdowns and the, like, I can't even do a capacity assessment despite the fact that I have a fellowship in behavioral neurology. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. So it, like there's all these issues, I think, um, in terms of legislation and how things go through and also the mechanics too. Of, like I've reported people to the ministry and somehow the facts gets lost. Like how does a fax that important get lost? You know? <laughs> so um, there needs to be like, um, I think, uh, kind of an overhaul of the whole system to make sure that people aren't falling through the cracks. And I, I, I will say, Richard, like we were, I work very closely with the people in government. They care about this issue as well. Uh, and the Ministry of Transportation, I'm really impressed with them. They're trying to be as thoughtful as they can. They're examining the data. Right. Um, and they, they also, this is an issue that affects everyone, right? Yeah. So transportation is seen as a social, it should be seen as a social determinant of health, much like uh, food, shelter, uh, amongst other things, because we need to be able to uh, get around our community. We need to support people to be able to do that. So um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm also hopeful that uh, some of the, some of the changes that we're seeing and through, through research like Can Drive, where we involve uh, the ministry right beside us, um, in, in that research that they hear and see from people like Mary as well, um, because sometimes we forget, right, when we're, um, we start to focus on long-term care and not think about the people that are managing in their community, um, and how do we keep people managing well in the community, which is, of course, a focus here at the McMaster Institute for Research on Aging. Jazine. Thanks, Brenda and Richard, um, for your participation in our webinar today, and it's, it looks like there's a lot of work for Mira still to do. Um, that was very insightful. If you have questions for our speakers, please email us at miraInfo at mcmaster.ca and we will forward them. In closing, we have a few announcements about upcoming Mira events. Uh, we invite you to register for lunchtime webinar tomorrow at 1230. Join Donna Thompson, caregiver, author, and activist for a 20-minute conversation about the role caregivers play in society, why education and support for caregivers is critical, and best tips for co-designing a better health system. This event is co-sponsored by Mira, McMaster Continuing Education, and hosted by the Waiting Room Revolution podcast. We also invite Mira members to save the date, April 12th, 10 to 11.30 a.m. for our next Mira Idea Exchange, where we will be discussing strategies for launching new non-COVID-related research in a post-pandemic setting.
Thank you so much everyone for joining us today and have a wonderful afternoon.